support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. And hello again, everyone. We trust you're enjoying a safe and peaceful Thanksgiving holiday. And with a couple of others just around the corner, holidays that is, we'll look at what the new year is likely to bring in business and politics. That's in a moment. First, the election just concluded. Once again, Arkansas underperformed much of the rest of the nation in terms of how many of us voted. Although midterm elections invariably attract fewer folks to the polls than in a presidential balloting, this year's nationwide turnout was fairly spirited, about 46% of the eligible population. That's nationwide. Arkansas's turnout was about five points fewer. Why? And was polling this year a better indicator of political sentiment than in previous elections? So we're joined by Dr. Janine Perry of the University of Arkansas's political science faculty and director of the Arkansas Poll and Dr. Heather Yates of the political science staff at the University of Central Arkansas. But first, in Shira Kwasi, our Gwen Eiffel Legacy Fellow, has a report about why her home state of Arkansas has one of the lowest voter turnout rates and how to encourage young voter participation. Right now on the national scale in Arkansas, it's not very competitive, and I think that does depress turnout when people don't think it matters, when they think that the, the winner is a foregone conclusion. The situation is bleak. But we found young people hoping to turn things around by building change at the grassroots level. The Young Dems have really done the best that we can to take the message that voting is important to people directly. Don't even register to vote for the president. But, you, but do you want to do it? it? It's so important. And if young people show up, we can literally change everything. It's different if one of your peers or a young person says, do you want to get registered to vote? Voting is the way we get to have an exchange with people that we don't get to talk to every day by registering what we think at the polls. The older generation isn't always going to be the older generation forever, and someday that's going to be us. And we're going to have to live in a world and in a country where the majority of us didn't vote and we didn't express our opinions. And then we're left with issues that could have been resolved when we were younger, and instead we're having to deal with them when we're older. And we're back. Janine Perry will go to you first. In these fevered, spirited times that we seem to be in, did the turnout surprise you at all? Or are we just more or less accustomed in Arkansas to voting in fewer numbers than some of our neighbors? Well, I mean, I, I think it's it's both things at once. Um, most of us are paying attention to the hot contests at the national level because that's what's on all of our nationalized news uh, sources for the most part. Um, and so things feel spirited, but then they're not, of course, uh, at the state level on down. And Arkansas is not an exception in that regard. That's true in uh, most of the states. But in terms of Arkansas's own performance, you really have two aspects that have long been the case. One is that we're lower uh, in terms of both of the factors that are strong predictors of political participation of all types, and that's education and income. So Arkansas's poorer and has a lower educational attainment, and that's reflected in her political participation. But then the other aspect are, you know, we've been slow to adopt some of the changes that most of our peer states have that we know boost turnout because it reduces the cost of registering and voting. So that would be, you know, things like um, having the online option to uh, register or, um, you know, giving, um, having uh, no excuse absentee uh, voting or easier mail ballots, you know, things along those lines that we know from decades now of research and political science that uh, will increase voter turnout. Uh, by a few points. Uh, every every step we take, uh, we can actually get a, a, a modest increase, and Arkansas has so far opted not to do those things. Yeah, Heather Yates, there would not appear to be much sentiment, uh, in fact, for doing some of those things. I would like to echo what Dr. Perry has outlined for Arkansas and add and punctuate that culturally, Arkansas has had a long history of single party dominance. And so when you're a voter that identifies with the out party, the observation that your impact or that you have very low feelings of um, agency or feeling like you have the ability to impact government through elections. So it is a conflation 
of all of the very practical aspects that the state legislature governs and, and then the um, state election officers govern, and it's also culturally. And what we have seen since the election of 2020 in Arkansas and within the region um, broadly is that state legislatures have no appetite for making voting easier. As a matter of fact, restricting access to the ballot box is what we're seeing that trend. And that was actually in play in the midterm election in the governor's race. Arkansas reduced early voting from 30 days to three weeks is one example. So in other words, what we're looking at is a combination of factors here, but we haven't mentioned money too. And that would seem to be a, a crucial factor in that uh, Ms. Sanders was really the only, uh, in terms of the statewide races, she was the only nominee really who had an opponent with m any real money behind. It, it was a, a man in this case. Uh, that's true, but we also want to keep in mind that the marijuana measure, uh, at least the, the pro forces in particular, had a lot of money. And money, we know, does stimulate uh, turnout. So it's probably a reason Arkansas wasn't uh, lower uh, than she she could have been. I think she came in 39th overall. Uh, she was actually um, uh, up a few points uh, from 2018, but that's because in 2018 she was again among among the lowest. So it does spur some interest, uh, particularly right when when people see advertisements when when they get some one on one um, communication. But it's just really hard to work against. <laughs> It almost doesn't matter how much money there is if you're working against all of these other demographic factors, these other institutional factors. And as uh, Dr. Yates rightly points out, uh, the um, cultural, long-term cultural factors, uh, including low competition in Arkansas politics. Did either of the, do we have a good sense at all uh, uh, post-election of how important younger voters were? Were they a significant factor in Arkansas? Because certainly they were in, uh, elsewhere in the nation. Heather? In Arkansas, it appears not um, for a couple of reasons. One, in Arkansas, the mobilized voters are um, going to be mid-range, upper level um, age-wise voters. These are also the voters that participate in the polling on the ground. There's two formidable polls that are deployed in Arkansas on the ground. Um, what we see in terms of any kind of youth bump was only about um, 2%. Two to three percent, and so this observation is built upon all of the other contextual uh, items that Dr. Perry and I have outlined. Right, so we've got this mounting kind of um, mountain of evidence that shows how difficult it is to mobilize um, young persons. And also, I'd like to echo and punctuate something that was already pointed out: is the role of money in advertising is that buys exposure. And so that is already probably mobilizing people who have got in their minds or made their minds up how they're going to vote, have a voting plan. Um, we don't have a whole lot of evidence showing how um, these, these finite campaign cycles actually have any persuasion effects. They do have mobilization effects, and that's what Dr. Perry, I think, was rightly pointing out. Yeah, Janine Perry? Yeah, it's just tough to get those young folks voted. We, voting. We know that we had a 30-year high nationwide, um, but there are always the... Uh, we were just talking about this in my class, actually, that um, it's always the lowest turnout group. You know, they barely hit 20 to 22 percent turnout most of the time. And in addition to that, this generation is a small generation. So they're really going to have to punch above their weight in significant ways, uh, in particular when they face uh, boomers who have the money and the experience and the education uh, to turn out. And then also they're a really big uh, demographic group, right? Um, that, that big bump in our, our population demographics. So um, these younger folks are significantly different uh, than the generations uh, ahead of them, I think more so even than in the past. But if they wanna make a difference, uh, they're really gonna have to uh, step up their game. And there's a lot in Arkansas working against them in that regard. Uh, there's no saying, I think, that you don't really get interested in voting until you have a mortgage. Uh, <laughs> but, but in terms of issues, you know, we had uh, Janine Perry mentioned marijuana was on the ballot, and that was a very expensive ballot proposition uh, for both sides. Elsewhere in the country, abortion was a, uh, a motivating factor, we know, in a great many uh, jurisdictions but apparently not so much in Arkansas. Do you think that owes to the fact that we are such a conservative state, that we're, we're so red? Heather Yates? So I'd like to outline a couple of factors that are playing into this, that nationally there was um, a Dobbs effect, but 
if we really drill down into that data, we see that there are different regional um, inflections of the Dobbs effect, or, or put another way, different intensities. In Arkansas and throughout the South as a, a region, we actually see very conventional variables outweighing Dobbs effect. Um, I do want to also offer the observation that even though we don't see the the so-called Dobbs effect mobilizing voters to the polls, we actually do pick that up in a few attitude changes in polling on the ground from 2021 to 2022. Um, there have been some changes in attitudes, but that didn't manifest at the ballot box. What we do see on the ground in Arkansas and throughout the South is kind of an over, um, I should say an outsized impact of the political economic cycle because the South as a region was disproportionately impacted by rising costs according to that consumer pricing index. And so when you have the South that is experiencing this outsized economic impact, that actually translated into a very conventional forecasting model um, because the political economic models gauge two things, um, the second quarter economic reports and then presidential approval ratings. And in Arkansas, Biden bottoms out about 31 percent, which is trailing about 10 points behind the national average. So I don't know that it's actually a culturally conservatism argument that we can offer in this data, but the political economic model of election forecasting performed as expected on the ground in Arkansas because voters, especially in the polls, were um, expressing the issue of economy and inflation as one of the yeah. principal outweighing issues. And that is where Republicans have polling advantages. And that played out in Arkansas. Let me go to Janine Perry and on the nature of survey research itself. The, uh, the survey research industry has been going through a great period of re-examination over the last, really the last decade. Changes in technology, how do we reach the right sample, et cetera. How do the, as a whole, how do the, we know the Arkansas poll is extremely accurate, but how did the industry do as a whole? Are we, is it catching up with the times with the technology? Well, the, the problem, I think, for polling is that uh, in the broader tech culture, there are always new platforms and new distractions, new ways to reach people, the old ways die out. Uh, and so nationally, you know, they, the pollsters will catch up, uh, and um, uh, but then, you know, the technology will change again. I guess the, the good news for pollsters in Arkansas is that Arkansas is always a couple of decades behind the times. Uh, so for now in Arkansas, the best samples uh, seem to be those that are using the older technologies. So like we've introduced, of course, significant cell phone responses into our traditional um, sampling approach uh, by, by telephone. But if you, uh, you know, adopt the, the texting technology that's been uh, more efficient financially, uh, as well as you can get things, you know, faster, it's just not a good technology for Arkansas because it, it just really is not a, an accurate distribution of of likely voters. That will change over time. Um, the technologies will uh, um, adapt, right, and, and evolve, but uh, Arkansas is a little slower to do that. So that's really the reason uh, we're, we're having effective polling here, just using telephones. Okay, got to end it there because we are simply out of time. Janine Perry, Heather Yates, thanks very much for being with us, as always, and come back soon. Thanks. Thanks. We'll be right back. Back now with a couple of familiar faces and familiar bylines, independent journalist Steve Brauner and Wes Brown, publisher of The Daily Record. Gents, thanks for coming aboard. We are just uh, you know a few weeks away now from a new chief executive officer of the state of Arkansas. And what do we expect, Steve? Well, I think she's going to uh, basically what, what Sarah wants, Sarah will get. I think she'll have a... Uh, a very successful uh, first session. Uh, there's typically a honeymoon period for all governors, uh, and she will have a, a very good one because of her her status in the party, her personnel, her persona. Uh, so I think she'll it'll it'll be a, a successful session for her. What will she do with it? Still, so we don't. She didn't give us a lot of details during the campaign. It's obvious that education will be a huge uh, focus of hers. Expect to see. Uh, an emphasis on, on school choice. We don't know what that's going to be exactly, but it's going to be, she's going to, there will be a move to offer, you know, parents a way to send kids to private schools if, if they want to. Yeah. Wes Brown, there's also criminal justice. She's on record as saying, let's, let's lock some more of them up. 
Yeah, like Steve said, I think there uh, uh, she'll get what she wants. Uh, uh, we're we're hearing words of uh, uh, possibly a, a new prison. What size that's going to be, we don't know. Uh, uh, as Steve said, also education is going to be a big focus. Will it be uh, administration? I, I think you'll have a totally a lot of new faces, a lot of new people uh, in her cabinet. Uh, 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 will she govern like DeSantis or, or other popular uh, uh, Republican governors? We'll have to wait and see. Like Steve said, we haven't talked to her. Uh, the press has reached out to try to, to communicate, uh, but we can't get her uh, in a press conference or, or in a personal interview. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what she says. Uh, when she comes into office at her state of the state address. Well, we have a general assembly, of course, that is redder than ever. I mean, there were super majorities before uh, now, and it'll be even larger, expanded their majorities in both chambers, Steve, uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in the November election. 29 in the Senate and 82 in the House. And uh, these are just, you know, basically, we're, is this a one party state or a no party state at this point? Uh, <laughs> because it's just so dominant. Right. Uh, in that fact, it may even be harder to have that big a majority. <laughs> uh, but, you know, interesting watching the Senate Organizational Committee meeting uh, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Senate education filled up really fast. What does that tell you? It tells you <laughs> there, there are plans afoot. Sure. Uh, and that was one of the few issues that, that Sanders really uh, offered a lot of detail about, uh, or not, not a lot, but some, at least gave More us an family. idea, at least gave us an acronym. Arkansas learns. So there, that, there will be a push to do that kind of thing, to, to allow parents to send kids, their kids to the schools using state dollars or, or, or at least tax credited dollars. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, how radical it is, is, that's what we'll have to wait and see. This has been tried numerous times and it's just gotten a little bit bigger each session, uh, different types of scholarships, but still not much because there's a lot of support for public schools, especially in this rural state where, right. where most communities don't have a private school. But we'll see how far it goes this time. Yeah, and West Brown too, uh, she got, Ms. Sanders, got almost two thirds of the vote cast. So if that's not a mandate, it's kind of tough to know what one is. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, earlier on, and some people were thinking if, if Chris Jones got to 40%, that would be kind of a victory for the Democratic nominee in the last few elections. Uh, Democrats haven't gotten higher than, uh, I think Jones got 35%. Uh, it's been lower than that in the previous election. So yes, she does have a, a, a mandate to, to govern. And I think uh, Steve mentioned the education committee, but it'll be interesting also the uh, judiciary committees in both the House and Senate to see who uh, who's gonna govern that and also you have a new Senate uh, president with uh, Bart Hester and to see how how uh, uh, they work together uh, uh, with the House speaker on the other side. Well, the, the leadership of the General Assembly, of course, and the, the governor have to make the numbers work. Now, right mm -hmm. now, the, you know, the Treasury is just overflowing with dollars, but I'm, one notices that the unemployment rate is kind of inching up a little bit, West Brown. So, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. you know, there, there's concern for the broader economy as well. So. Take it away. Yeah, I think I think the last time we had a a, a big surplus was back during the BB administration, uh, and, and but we do know <laughs> you know when you have a surplus, it's easy to spend. But uh, you know the economists are talking about a, a potential recession on the who wants wants to let in 2023 or 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 even some are saying we're already in one. So uh, the thing you know about doing economic good times when you have a surplus. That surplus can easily disappear, even one as big as the one that Arkansas has. So, I think uh, 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 if if they come in thinking that they're going to uh, spend and and spend and spend, that may not be the wise thing to do. Well, I would go back to criminal justice guys for just a second because every candidate, it seems, except maybe the nominees for land commissioner, were on board with uh, expanding the prison system. Now, no one. There's a good argument that can be made, one supposes, for adjusting the parole, pardon, well, the parole system anyway. But we're on track to add uh, something in the neighborhood of 1,500 beds over the near term. The construct, the capital cost, the initial cost of those prisons is high. 
but not as high as continuing to operate them over the next several years. So you're committing, we're going to commit the state to an, uh, tens of millions of dollars in ongoing appropriations. Even the Democratic candidates, though, tended to say that they were supportive. Sure. I mean, because at this point, we can discuss the, 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 the theories about how to, how to reduce crime and all that, but right now the, the, the jails are, are full and, and they can't just be let out, or they can be just let out, but no one wants to do that. I so. think we're about 2,000 inmates over capacity in the state system right now. Well, Senator Hester, the Senate Majority Leader, or the President Pro Tem, you know, he was asked by Robbie Brock the other day, you know, do we need 1,000 beds? And he said, I'm thinking 3,000. So right. it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, that we're going to build some prisons, uh, some prison space. Yeah. What's yeah, it would be interesting if, if you see something on the other side of it, you know, in, in, in terms of prevention. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, also the other things, those dollars, will will the teachers uh, get, a, get another raise? Uh, will they, uh, uh, it didn't happen in the special session, uh, and uh, uh, they pushed it kind of toward this 2003 session. So uh, I th uh, I think Democrats and and the educational system are hopeful that some of those that money will be set aside for for teacher pay and toward education. All right, uh, West Brown, what are we looking at do you, do you, in terms of economic development or economic trends anyway as as uh, as the new year approaches? What's the outlook? Let's start with Christmas retail. Uh, well, uh, the National Retail Federation said that that as. Uh, uh, it's kind of a mix uh, of forecast for, for the people who are going to spend, but they're going to be cautious and not spend as much as far as their personal budget. Uh, I think you're going to see a big Black Friday through uh, uh, Cyber Monday th this, pa or this upcoming weekend. You'll see a lot of people do a lot of their spending during these three days, three or four days. But then as we get closer to the cri Christmas, I think people are going to, uh, be more internally focused, uh, spending time with family, uh, not traveling as much, but staying close to their home. So I think, uh, and, and the biggest concern for, for most families, of course, is inflation. And uh, uh, and also we have a possible rail strike out there that could could see that uh, that Santa may not be able to get all his toys to, uh, <laughs> uh, to the proper place uh, around Christmas time. So that could be coming to play too. And in terms of the uh, inflationary impact, Steve, you know, whether it's supply chain or, or whatever, uh, the Department of Finance and Administration, well, the entire state government keeps a close eye on retail sales. Yes, and, and we've, along with that, we've had a, you know, it's a very, it's a very red state, but a very cautious Republican legislature. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's been a general feeling of let's be careful. We don't know how much of this is huge surplus is real and how much of it is kind of phony money from all this government, federal government com money coming in. So COVID relief. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, that stuff is still the, I, the infrastructure act still is, you know, barely gotten here. So, you know, liquidity is not the issue. We're, you know, mm -hmm. we're at gonna, the moment anyway. We're, we're <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> yeah. So there's, I, I think there'll be a, a lot of, you know, DFNA has always been extremely cautious and so are the legislators. Yeah, well, and that brings us back, yeah, Wes Brown, that brings us back to Ms. Sanders' plan or her campaign pledge to, as soon as possible, phase out the state income tax. Yeah, and that, that, that's always going to be an interesting debate at the state capitol, how much to cut we've had. Uh, that has been the legacy of, of our current governor who, who will be leaving office, Asia Hutchinson. His legacy has been economic development and tax cuts. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and coming in, can you continue uh, to cut, and and uh, uh, and where do you cut, and and who does it impact? Will it impact the middle class, the working class, which is what most people would prefer, uh, or will it go to uh, the wealthy, or or uh, will it go to business? So it'll be interesting how the debate goes. Uh, and, and we talked about that supermajority. I, I think a lot of the debate will be dominated by. Uh, 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 by the traditional, especially on the academic, developed the more moderate uh, Republicans that that are are still talking about fiscal issues rather than social issues. Yeah, and what we saw, Steve, during the the Hutchinson, the eight years of the Hutchinson administration, is basically you know two blocks of uh, two wings of the Republican Party in the General Assembly. 
Yeah, separated by ideology, uh, separated by region. Right. Urban versus rural. And rural. Mr. And Mr. Hutchinson on a tightrope, walking a tightrope between. It, he did. <laughs> if it was eight years of a, uh, of pragmatic government gov gubernatorial leadership. Yep. So he uh, he did have to do that. Uh, one thing that's interesting, by the way, that we should point out is that. Uh, uh, Ms. San Governor Elect Sanders today announced that she had uh, named her new senior advisor, Chris Caldwell, to her 2026 re-election campaign and transferred $2.5 million to her, to her account. So any thought that she's planning on coming and leaving, maybe she has plans to stay here for eight years. Well, does anyone believe that uh, her political plans end with the Arkansas governor's mansion? She's no, no. Uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, obviously uh, she was talking during the campaign. She was campaigning on national issues. She has close ties and has a great name recognition, a name recognition uh, among the, the Trump uh, Republicans. So uh, if the, I, I guess the, the litmus test will be who will be the leader for the Republican Party uh, uh, by the time we get around to over the next year and into the 2024 presidential election, who will lead the uh, 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 the Republican Party? If it's uh, if it's the Trump or, it, or if it's Trump, then of course she may have a a cabinet seat or or something else uh, uh, with Trump. Uh, or if, if it's DeSantis, then uh, then all bets are off. Yeah. Got to end it there because we're simply out of time, guys. Thanks for you for coming in as always. Thanks. We thank you for watching and see you next time. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89.